joining us at home. And tonight, for the first time ever, we have some in-person audience for Cooking with the Cat Times. Hello, everyone. <laughs> presenting sponsors sit for salmon shares for that message and thank you all for joining us tonight uh, for cooking with cat times with chef dan fox i'm chelsea decane Durabic, the audience strategist here i will pass it off to our food editor lindsey christians in a sec but first i want to thank our sponsors for making this video event series possible uh, presenting sponsor, as we saw, sit to salmon shares. Use the code Cook with Cap to get $25 off the first month of a premium Sitka seafood share. Learn more about their values and fishermen at sitkasalmonshares.com. We will drop this code and the link into the chat. Our official kitchen sponsor, where we are tonight, is Kessenix. For over 90 years, Kessenix has provided Madison and Dane County with quality products and outstanding customer service. Stop by their showroom uh, to shop like a chef because they're always open to the public. You can visit kessenix.com for more info. And our official beer sponsor, the beverage of some in-person audience tonight. They're enjoying the beer, I think, right, you guys? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kronbacher, a family brewer since 1803. We heard it might be Dan's favorite beer. Potentially. Okay. <laughs> the Kronbacher Brewery is the largest private brewery in Germany. Their claim has always been to brew beers of the highest quality. We hope you got some Kronbacher to enjoy while watching tonight's event at home. But we're also giving away a few 12 packs of Kronbacher to lucky viewers. There's an entry link that will drop into the chat. Click that to enter to win, and you must be 21 or older to win. And a quick plug that if you post any pictures on social media while watching tonight, please tag the Cat Times on Instagram and Twitter. We'd love to see them. And we want to thank any Cat Times members for joining us tonight and for your continued support of local journalism and our newsroom. If you're not a member, you can become one at membership.cattimes.com, and we'll post that link into the chat. Okay, I think I've said enough. You're great. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Lindsay, who is one of Wisconsin's foremost food writers and critics. Hala, yes, she is. Enjoy the event, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I just want to introduce you really quick to people who maybe don't know you already. So you are the chef and the owner of Heritage Tavern. Yes. Willow Creek Farms and Fox Heritage Farms out in, is it Salk Prairie? Prairie Sack? Prairie Sack. Prairie Sack. Prairie, yeah. Okay. Um, and so not only are you sort of involved in the, the cooking of, of things to give to diners and the restaurant, but you're also involved kind of on the back end. I've been to some of your pig farms with you. Yes. Which is very fun. It was very cold. Um, but I, I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about how you got into that side of things. Absolutely. Um, the Farm to Table movement, as it kind of started, uh, it's much more than a movement now. It's um, yeah. uh, it's really taking hold. Um, more than just more than this trendy, you know, chefs like myself are getting very, very hands on. I've become very, very hands on. <laughs> um, and really, my goal uh, was initially to create a better food system, or at least be part of that. Uh, there's an amazing, amazing people there uh, in Madison and the surrounding areas that I've learned from, had the benefit of Tony and Sue Ringer being two of one of my, my idols here in town. Mm -hmm. uh, I was able to buy Little Creek Farms from them and continue on that legacy. We haven't really changed anything. Um, the whole idea of our practice is we let pigs be pigs in their natural habitats and surroundings. Uh, our kind of running joke is they only have one bad day. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but that really means uh, a lot to us to make sure that we're raising healthy animals and uh, with sustainable practices. Uh, we use those practices on our farming ends, all the way through our processing and our meat plants in Prairie de Sac, and of course it integrates into our restaurant and our catering company. Yeah. So for this recipe that we're going to be doing tonight, you've got pork tenderloin. Yes. It's pretty accessible for folks to find at the grocery store. Um, but I also wanted to, to find out a little bit about where the recipe itself came from in terms of like what's its what's its background so i worked in an alsatian restaurant for quite some time alsace being in the northernmost part of france mm -hmm. kind of tucked into germany there um schnitzel uh that style became it was very popular and I, when i was traveling in france and working in france i had an opportunity to go to Austria. many versions of schnitzel, uh, of course, since we raise pigs, uh, it's a natural progression there. Uh, so a tenderloin is a really, really easy, you know, very approachable item, as you just mentioned. 
It can also land itself well into like pork loin, um, or other tough cuts of meat. Typically, schnitzel is with a tougher cut of meat, um, but can very easily be done with tender. It's probably the easiest way to go is with tender. Uh, and then loin and shoulder and then an alpha meat. Yeah. So for this one, we you're doing a marinade on it first, right? So you're kind of letting the buttermilk and the... Yes, we'll get All started. Right. Oh, yeah. Start okay, yeah. All right. Here Sorry, we go. yeah. <laughs> All right. So pork tenderloin. Uh, these are Willow Creek uh, tenderloin. So when we talk about Willow Creek Farms... I mean, I was going to ask you about your COVID and I was like, yeah, do we want to talk about that? Maybe we do. I yeah. start crying. Tears of joy. The sound is bad. Okay. Yeah, COVID, which we were just talking about, it's been a while right, right for any restaurateur. Um, anyone in the services industries, mm -hmm. industries um, and it's definitely not over for us, you know, on with labor shortages and, you know, shutting down is one thing, but getting the whole engine started back up is just something else entirely. Yeah. Uh, my heart goes out to anyone in the services industry, anyone in the restaurant business right now. It's uh, It's been really a test of will and... Uh, just staying power. Yeah, I loved how you adapted last uh, last summer, not only with the beautiful tents outside of Heritage Tavern, but also you were selling, like, I think I came away with, like, some sausages for the freezer, and eventually I was like, oh, yeah, you know, totally, I need a pork shoulder. Like, so we got dinner, and we also got, like, just whole meat, which was great, because it was kind of like, yeah, I'm cooking a ton right now anyhow, so. Yeah, we were selling meat everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Good. But um, our customer base wholeheartedly supported us. Uh, I can't thank at home enough uh, it's really it was very very humbling um and we're still here and we're super excited and people are coming back and we don't have mass on right now and we're cooking in front of people it's great, yeah. yeah it's so energizing so so what you're doing right now you remove a little bit of the silver skin is that what so you're doing, i'll or? do that one more time yeah it's something i'd actually like to show you yeah I'm just in your recipe it says to cut the, the tenderloin in half you know tenderloins are not all the same size and shape so if you want to cut it down to smaller medallions uh your recipe says in half uh, but smaller medallions will work just fine as well. These are actually fours. Uh, so we're doing a little bit smaller portions here. Okay. So on um, the tenderloin here, when we talk, talk about a tenderloin out of any animal, um, that comes on the inside of the rib cage. So if I was a pig and I hunched over, <laughs> on my back would be the loins coming on the back ends. So that and the rides down the rib cage. Uh, the, all the ribs up in the front, those are where you get your pork chops from. And then underneath the rib cage on the inside, that's where the tenderloins are. And they're tender because they don't move. Um, two of them per animal, right? Two of them per animal. Which is so part of why they sell out quick at a butcher shop. Yep, they're, they're, two, two. they're small <laughs> yeah. and they're, they're expensive. So, yeah. um, but again, if you don't want to use tenderloin, uh, you can definitely get into loin, uh, would work just fine. Uh, chicken, veal, will all work well in this recipe as well. So for the silver skin, that's connected, connected tissue. It's a little bit more, um, it's uh, not as, it's a little toothy. Um, we're gonna just, I'm trying to think about it. It's, it's yeah. not the most pleasant uh, thing to eat. We're just gonna bring our knife underneath. I'm gonna angle the knife up against the silver skin gently and just kind of ride that along. So it just kind of rides up on the silver skin. You don't want to go down, of course, because it all cut into the meat. And I'm gonna do the same on the other side. Just pull that nice and tight and just kind of flay that right off. Do you have to remove all of it, or do you, do you try to remove all of it, or if I like get it mostly? Well, I'm a perfectionist, so I try to remove okay. it all, but you know, I, I'm not going to on this one, just to kind of show you at home that it doesn't need to 100% be. Okay. You really just want to get off the bigger pieces, and I'm going to leave those pieces of fat on there. Okay. With that, just kind of melt away in the pan. If you want to remove those, of course, you know, please go ahead and do so. Is this Berkshire? This is Berkshire, so that's, thank you for asking that. <laughs> <laughs> Little Creek pigs are, are the Berkshire pigs. So Berkshire is one of the oldest English 
loose breeds. Mm -hmm. um, it is an amazing heritage breed for the sake of giving a, an awesome like fat to meat ratio. Mm -hmm. A lot of times with heritage pigs, you're going to get a higher fat content. Yeah. Um, we were marketing the other red meat for a while, uh, <laughs> which gives itself lends itself to the deep red color of this uh, yeah. of this type of pig. Uh, it's just a touch more flavor, and you get the, a lot of that intermuscular marbling. All right, so now that we've cut these down into size, uh, you can use a Ziploc bag at home. Uh, you can use pieces of plastic wrap for whatever on top of each other. Yeah. Uh, wax paper does work. Wax paper can sometimes split on you or get kind of wet. So um, I'm just gonna drive a knife right down the side of this to open this up. Pop this inside. And I have a little mallet here. Just kind of gently that down. Looking for a quarter inch. No exact science there. And that's it. It's so satisfying if you've had kind of a week. It's like <laughs> pound the crap out of something like that. I love it. It makes me just like, okay, yes, I'm, I'm working some stuff out. <laughs> so I'm going to pound down a few of these guys. So tenderloins are much more tender, as I was describing. Uh, so you're going to want to be careful when you pound them down versus like a loin, but you're going to want to use a little bit more force versus like a piece of shoulder, which you're going to want to really pound down. You're using the side of the mallet that has the little, what, the texture, I guess? Little teeth on there, or yeah, texture see, or yeah. something. Yeah. Um, I'll use kind of both sides. That is really great for um, just breaking down that muscle tissue, the muscle fibers, and then just kind of get a nice little flatten out here at the end. Quarter inch? Quarter inch. Mm -hmm. All right. So now that I've pounded those flats, I have some buttermilk. Marinate these in. I'm putting these into a bag. You can put them right into a container. A bag works super well, Ziploc bag. I'm going to add some fresh herbs of rosemary, thyme, and crushed bay leaf. Now, I encourage you to, if you have a garden, hopefully you do, uh, go out into your garden and pick whatever herbs you have. If it's tarragon, if it's dill, if it's whatever. Uh, woody herbs is nice, but something that else it would definitely complement this just fine. Yeah, nice. I like that you don't have to take any of the leaves off of the stems, which is always an irritating thing. <laughs> um, but it's just marinated, so you don't have to do that. Exactly. So we got that nice and, and marinated. Um, just make sure all the pieces are separated and the buttermilk's going in between. We use buttermilk. It's a higher acid milk, uh -huh. uh, and that acid helps break down the muscle tissue. Does it matter if it's low fat or whole fat? Or uh, That is a great question. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, I, mean, I don't know if one has more acid than yeah. that. I really don't know. Um, I would assume I just always go for more fat. Yeah, more fat. Know, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, I was going to say. But I'm sure, I'm sure it'll work just fine. Okay, cool. Um, and we'll let that sit for at least two hours or up to 24. Okay. A couple days would be fine. I wouldn't go any more than that. Because it'll start to break down the meat? It'll, yeah, it'll go a little bit too far. Okay. Um, and if you could actually freeze that just like this. Oh. Lay it flat, freeze it, and that can hold for a couple months and pull it out when you're ready. That's cool. I never would have thought of that. So meal prep, schnitzel, and the fridge. Amazing, yes. Pull it out when you want. All right, so I'm going to set that aside. I'm going to set this back into the cooler. Please. Uh, so we are wanting, it, I mean, it could be a half an inch. Uh, a quarter inch, it's a, a nice size that's going to cook evenly and quickly in your pan. Uh, you're not going to have to finish it in the oven or something. So if you went like an inch or a half inch, you're going to, which is just fine. Uh, we, I actually used to do it like that. Uh, you're going to want to finish it in the oven. Uh. And whenever we're cooking pork, we always want to try to get up to close to 140-ish. Okay. You know, uh, I go a little bit under 140 just because I do like a little bit of pink in the center. Uh, but if you're at home and you really want to make sure, 145 is your number. Related question, actually. So with the pounding, my husband will always be like, why can't we just cut? it really thin like try to cut it because you're breaking something down right exactly yeah the, the 
so if, if you think of like a muscle tissue as like a, a mesh, you know, mm -hmm. as you're breaking, it just breaks down that mesh, mm -hmm. you know, so it's no longer uh, that connective tissue breaks down, the muscle tissue breaks down, and it's much more tender for you. Nice. With slicing it thin, if you slice it thin, it actually rubber bands up in the pan. Ah. Uh. Yeah, versus staying nice and tender. Fish and will flat. do that too sometimes. Fish will rubber band up, like contract, I feel like. Yeah, especially with the skin on it sometimes. Yeah. So I uh, pull out a piece of bacon here. Uh, I understand not everyone at home is going to have a big slab of bacon. <laughs> <laughs> you can buy these, like places like Conscious Carnivore in town. Uh, the meat people, I think, just opened up, but there's definitely small butcher shops. I would definitely highly recommend those. And of course, you can visit us in Prairie de Sac at our meat plants <laughs> or go online and buy our bacon. Uh, but all the folks around here are doing a great job. You can find this, but if you can't find this, I would try to get like thicker bacon, thick cut mm -hmm. bacon, and just cut it into thinner strips, um, quarter inch strips. Okay. So for this, we're gonna small dice. I put this bacon in the freezer. That's kind of a little, uh, I guess, pro tip or something. Pro tip, yeah. Um, it just bacon when it gets really soft, it's very difficult to slice and drive a knife through it. When it's frozen, it is much easier. I've done this with like chicken thighs before when I've really wanted to just have more control because they're so gloopy. Yeah, that's yes. it's a technical term. There you go, pro tip. Yeah. <laughs> chicken thighs in the freezer. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to dice this up. I have a pan behind me. I'm going to start getting warm. And then we will render this bacon out over low heat. So for this dish, the, the, the whole concept of the dish, we're gonna do a fried piece of, a panko crusted piece of pork tenderloin or schnitzel with a radish, fennel, and cabbage slaw, a little pickled rhubarb, and then a bacon and mustard dressing that goes over the slaw. So this is part of the dressing right now. I was looking in the recipe for things that could be easily made ahead. So you can do like the buttermilk marinade, obviously ahead, needs to be made ahead, the pickled rhubarb ahead. Like there are a lot of things that you can just do when you have time to and then assemble it on the night of. 100%. Like yeah. yeah, the dressing, the rhubarb, uh, the marinated pork loin. Yeah. Yes, oh yeah, of course. I forgot to say that. Can you grab one more of these honey boards? I have my sister over there helping me out. <laughs> my sister Amanda actually just became an owner at Heritage. That's really, uh, it's really amazing. She's a partner in the restaurant now. Uh, we couldn't be more excited and more proud of that. Grab some water here. I have a question about bacon. Oh, Please. Yeah. What is the difference between bacon and then the fresh? I'm sorry, streaky bacon? Um, I was abroad in the UK for a while, mm -hmm. and they give you rashers of bacon, which, and then we call our bacon streaky bacon, which is what you just. I've never, oh. I've never heard of that. The question is about streaky bacon versus rashers, and it has a UK connection. Maybe somebody in the audience knows, actually. I don't, I've never heard of streaky bacon. Well, they just call American bacon is. Huh. Yankee bacon. Huh. Yankee bacon. Yeah. What does it look like? Oh, so a rasher of bacon, it's got a larger portion of the protein, and then the fats kind of on the outside. Oh. Oh, I see. But it's still cured. It's still cured. It's still yeah. got the bacon flavor. It's in the traditional English breakfast and Irish breakfast. I mean, it sounds delicious. Yeah. Interesting. So I just want bacon. Things to do with pork. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So for our slaw, uh, so we have our bacon rendering. That's going to be for our dressing. We're going to jump back over to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. We keep a wandering eye on that. Uh, then we're going to get into our slaw veg. Uh, first thing we're going to want to do is our cabbage. We're going to want to wilt this down a little bit, or it's called macerating. So it's, that's obviously a half cut, a half a head of cabbage. I'm gonna split that into a quarter. I'm gonna cut that little stem out of the center. I'm gonna open it up. Oh, someone responded, you guys. <gasps> Whoa. Streaky bacon, American, has the protein, while the rashers, the UK 
Bacon. It's mostly fat. Oh my gosh. The more you know. I love it. Streaky bacon is like American style bacon. There we go. That's fantastic. No. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. One thing I was asking about this earlier is whether you could use a food processor, and you said yes. No. What did I say? No. You, you said, said it was no. fine. It was fine. Yeah, you could. <laughs> <laughs> you could. For speed, I'm just so, saying. So yeah, yeah, for speed, I 100. If you had like a shredder on there. Oh yeah. Shredder might be the way. Yeah, to go. I totally with the, the suspense and yeah. Shredder. Yeah, that totally. would be 100 mm -hmm. fine. Cool. I'm looking for shortcuts. <laughs> no. I, it, it, it could be shredded finer down. It's just going to be a little different. It's yeah. Going to break down a little, which it's still going to taste good, I'm sure. Uh, so opening that that piece of cabbage up just kind of helps me flat that out, so I can come through and almost a julienne on this. And then, uh, like I said, we're gonna macerate this. So pretty much what we're doing, we're gonna sprinkle some salt and sugar. Like anytime I'm making a slaw, summer cabbage slaw, I will macerate my cabbage first, which helps leach out a lot of the moisture that's in the cabbage. Like if you make sauerkraut or something, you throw a bunch of salt on your cabbage and it leaches out all that moisture and kind of creates a brine. It's almost the same idea. Because mm -hmm. I don't want all that moisture to end up watering down my slot right i get massive cabbage from my csa every year like cabbages the size of my head bigger um can i use green cabbage can i use other kinds of cabbage in this is it is it does it matter green cabbage would be just fine okay um a leafier cabbage like napa i wouldn't say would maybe need this step right here oh okay i mean you could do it it's just the te i would like a little bit of that bite on the, the crunch cabbage, yeah the crunch the, the texture for sure okay a little sugar, a little salt, less sugar than salt. And we're gonna toss that and let that sit for a couple hours. So I've already done some up ahead of time. <gasps> Cookie show magic! <laughs> and you'll be able to see, hopefully, some of the moisture running down to the bottom of that bowl, that liquid. And that's what we're trying to get rid of there. You, know, you almost will pour some out. You can kind of see that pouring out. Oh, that's what we want to do. The color is beautiful. <laughs> it's sort of like you'll do that with like a cucumbers too, right? When you want yes. to, yeah. You can ma almost any any vegetable for that matter, or fruits will macerate. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll macerate strawberries. We want them to break down or blueberries, other types of berries. Fennel we've macerated. Um, cabbage is a big one. It's just kind of a normal practice for slaw. I just really hate it when it gets uh, all watered down on us. Yeah, yeah. So we're running out that bacon. Uh, we're just about there. We can start to see that caramelization happening. We want to go just a touch further. It smells so good. <laughs> it smells really good. Like, and yeah. we're gonna keep on working on our fennel slaw. Our cabbage fennel slaw. I have a little uh, mandolin here. I have a metal glove at home for my slicer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, because you will slice your finger off. Well, I have sliced my finger off. Not off. Not off. But I've sliced it. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. was really uncomfortable. It was embarrassing. <laughs> More embarrassing. <laughs> Almost there with the bacon. How are we doing on time here? I think we're doing okay. I can check. Yeah, 26, 626. We're doing awesome. good. I love this such th like the thin, thin cut fennel with like Parmesan and lemon and. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's really good. Radishes the same. We just pick these up at the market. Roots Down has beautiful radishes right now. Yes. Roots Down Community Farm. Kyle at Roots Down does an yes. amazing, They're amazing gorgeous. job. Um, He's got quite the hemp crop. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're gonna call that good. That nice little caramelization there. Nice. I'm just gonna turn the heat off and let that sit for a second. You're not, you're not draining that at all. We will drain it. You will drain it, okay. And I'll save the fat. Got it, okay. The key thing with making bacon is you always need to make a little extra so you can <laughs> yeah. snack on it, yeah. It's the key thing. And then some red onion. Just get that really thin. 
and this component is to have like this crunchy sort of fresh like counterpoint to that schnitzel that we're doing exactly right something like this you can use all kinds of different veggies in it too right and i was thank you for saying yeah. that. yes you're absolutely right um and I, I encourage you to play around as the season goes along um it could take summer squash it could take nice. almost raw butter um winter squash it could take uh, a little potato salad it, could, it uh, really is pretty yeah. universal and that dressing the mustard dressing i'm going to show you right now uh can mix on all, almost all of the above mm -hmm. so i'm gonna set that aside we have our fennel radish and and onion. And now for our dressing. I'm gonna stay away from the bacon fat here. <laughs> so I wanna capture all of that fat that's in there. I'm gonna be using that in the dressing. So make sure to go back around and scrape out all that that's left in there. Very good. Let me grab me one more of these bowls, please. And let that sit just for a moment to drain out. So for the dressing, we have red wine vinegar, apple cider vinegar can also work. Thank you so much. When we were editing this recipe, my editor was like, just checking two kinds of mustard, why? So I thought, why two kinds of mustard? <laughs> uh, really, the, so we have Dijon mustard. It's a great creamy, nice acidulated mustard. Uh, and then the stone grounds really for that texture. Mm -hmm. And that nice little pop of the mustard seeds I think is, uh, is really lovely. Yeah. That is the comment that I put in the Google Doc. Lovely. I said, I think it's a textural thing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. And then some lemon juice. Oh, nice. Okay. And so this is maple syrup? It is maple syrup. Okay. Thank you. Acid. Just acid. Salty, sweet, fat acid, salt, sweet, fat acid, right? Yeah. That the, That's yeah. the mean nose, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of when, and at the bottom of the recipe that I put out there, it says to adjust salt, fat, acid. Mm -hmm. Fat balances like a vinaigrette. Vinaigrette's always a classic 70 30 of fat to uh, vinegar. So you always need that vinegar to kind of balance things out. So we're going to a little uh, stone ground, Dijon, equal parts. Splash of our vinegar. I think I said two tablespoons in the recipe. Lemon juice. A little bit of maple syrup. I like using maple syrup. Uh, I think Wisconsin produces some really amazing, awesome maple syrup. Uh, I think it's just a nice little substitute for everyone going like traditional honey. But of course, honey would work just fine. A little salt in there. And then we're going to slowly pour our fat in. You want to help me with that? Mm -hmm. Are you ready? Perfect. Cool. Excellent, thank you. Do we need a supplement with oil at all, or is that enough? We are going to put a little oil in there, and that is right behind you in that. Oh, yes. Okay. So what we are doing is a setting an emulsion. So emulsion is pretty much just making sure it binds together. Mm -hmm. This is not going to be a permanent emulsion. It's going to be a temporary emulsion. Uh, so if it breaks a little bit, don't be too concerned. You can whisk it back together. But the idea of an emulsion, you start out with your emulsifying agents, which would be egg, mustard, something of that nature. And then you're putting your vinegar or whatever acid you're using. And then you slowly, slowly pour in your fat or oil, which we are going to do right now. Yeah, tell me how much. Uh, about a tablespoon or two. Go for the yeah, that's good. All righty. The mustard helps it stay together, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Absolutely. And again, this is a temporary emulsion, so don't be too concerned if it if it sits and breaks on you, just whisk it back together. All right. We'll let that sit. 
Okay, so we are gonna move on to our pork, cooking our pork. Do you still need this out? I am going to need it for these pans. All right, cool. Thank you. Right. What uh, are these burners? These induction burners? Yeah, cooking by numbers. <laughs> Is that my favorite thing? Um, and I'm gonna heat these up back here. Fire. Always, always reliable. Yeah, at least I can see it. Yeah. Medium flames, medium flame, always. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna heat those pans up over a medium high heat. I have some pork that's already been marinating. One. There's my 24 hours. I love, I love kitchen show magic. It's just great. Might be a good time. Does anybody have a beer? One. All right, we got to take your one more Kronbacher. Official sponsor coming right up. All right. So I'm going to remove these from the bag and put them on a towel here to absorb a lot of that extra moisture. And then we have some panko breadcrumbs. Panko breadcrumbs are a high gluten breadcrumb. Uh, so what does that mean? Pretty much when you fry it up in a pan and you let it sit for five, 10 minutes, it'll stay nice and crispy. It doesn't absorb as much right behind Oh, me. sorry. It won't absorb as much moisture and it keeps your product nice and dry. Versus regular breadcrumbs, which are just fine to use, uh, but you might get sacrifice a little bit of that uh, crispiness. All right. I was gonna say there's still pork in there. I'll throw it away. Oh, you can smell the acidity. Like, you can, oh, well, you can't smell acidity. Um, but it, but it's, the sour? Can, yeah, the yeah, sourness the sour, of it, yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah, it's nice. It has a nice, pleasant flavor as well. So there's still a little buttermilk on there. That's totally fine. We're going to put it right into the panko. Does anyone know what this is called? Right in there? Chris, maybe? No? Dredging. Okay, dredge, dredging. Yeah. 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 So dredging. Uh, it's whenever you're putting raw products right into dry breadcrumbs versus like three-step breading where you're doing um, flour, egg wash, and then breadcrumbs. Oh, you're doing the thing with, without mentioning it, but I, so sometimes uh, with, with dredging, I was watching a fried chicken demo and you have like a dry hand and a wet hand, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? That is a really good piece of advice. Yeah. It really, really is, honestly. <laughs> yeah, it's just like one hand that's, yeah, and then to be able to shake it off, shake it off, like Taylor Swift. All right, so I'm putting all my pork pieces in there. Is there salt and pepper in here already or no? I am going to season them in just okay. a second. Just checking. Sometimes there's seasoning in the dredge, you know? Absolutely. You can definitely put seasoning right into the dredge. Would okay. work just fine here. Um, we are going to put the seasoning on now. Please. Start the Q&A, let me just go there. Uh, we'd love to hear about Dan's Michelin experience. What an accomplishment. Dan, congratulations again. I worked at a Michelin restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> I had no Michelin under my belt, but... Um, was, it, was it runner up though as well? Not for Michelin. Michelin isn't hasn't made its way here, but... We, I, I, James Beard. Away. James Beard. Guys, okay. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Thank you. I was like, <laughs> maybe one day Michelin will make its way up here. You could have, you could do the beard house though, yeah. You could do the beard yeah, house. I cooked the beard house like five times. times. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and I made it a few times, and we have an amazing, amazing team at Heritage that I can't thank and express enough that has brought us all those places. Yeah. And that. Almost all the kitchen team is still there after the pandemic. Nice, that's great. Yeah, it's a really big deal for us. And now we're gonna season with just a little bit of salt. So these are pretty dry now, right? Like, yes. Yeah. 
I feel like this is a mistake that I often make when I'm doing, I'm pan frying is my the stuff is too wet when it goes in. So I don't get the crispiness. Oh, sure. Yeah, if you're, if it is still residually wet, uh, you'll want to be careful of that. Yeah. Things Lindsay does wrong <laughs> <laughs> amongst the things. All right. So that was just salt? That wasn't pepper, just right? Just salt. Just salt, okay. And then we'll put a little pepper there to finish it. Cute little grinder. Diane asked, Dan, when did you know you wanted to be a chef? Oh, it was a, a road for me. So I went to five different schools before I figured out what I really wanted to do. Uh, I dropped out of my fifth school, or fourth school, to go into culinary school. Uh, right around then, I was cooking more for my friends and family, um, working in restaurants, and just decided I wanted to get culinary school shot. I really didn't know 100% what I was getting myself into. Uh, but once I got to culinary school, I absolutely fell in love with it and, and the rest is kind of history. So we got we brought our pans up medium high heat. So this is gonna go pretty quick here uh, once we start rolling. Um, we're going to pan fry our schnitzel. Um, I'll walk through that and then we're gonna get our slaw together and then we'll start plating. So please ask questions as we go. Uh, for pan frying, I want enough oil in the pan. We're not gonna be deep frying, uh, but enough that it's not gonna dry out in our pan. Really, it should come up on the product almost about halfway up the product for pan frying. The oil should come up about halfway. And one kind of telltale sign, of course, smoke coming up out of the pan. You don't want billowing smoke, um, but if the oil is kind of running like water, that's when you know it's ready to go. Does the popcorn test work for this? Do you know what I mean by that? When you put a little kernel of popcorn in, when it pops, it's ready. Oh, I've never done it before. <laughs> it's just a little. I'm learning so much stuff today. <laughs> um, I will often use that as like a temp check because then it like it's visible and I. Uh, you can eat the popcorn if you want. <laughs> but that's more oil than I usually use when I pan fry, and I feel like that's part of why I pan fry so badly. All right. So we drop those in. So you want to see that sizzling when you drop in. You always drop away from you. That's a very important. This one. So you'll let it just kind of slide away. So any oil that drops down flies away from you, not towards you. So you want a little bit of negative space in between your pieces. Home, I would use tongs for what you're doing, most likely. Uh, chefs. Yeah, no, chef fingers, chef hands. Chef hands, yeah. <laughs> lose, uh, you know. When I was a barista, I had no feeling in the pads of my fingers, but it's come back. <laughs> this is for when they're done that they can. Yes. Yeah. So we are pan frying, medium Drain heat. Bit, yeah. I have a, what we call a drop tray, pretty much a tray already ready to go with the paper paper towels or towel on there. I definitely recommend having this ready to go before you start this process. Cause this goes quick. This goes quick. And you don't want them too close together because otherwise they won't brown right, right? They will not brown right, yes. Yeah. You want the negative space in the pan. If you put too many pieces in there, like two or three more pieces, it's called overloading your pan. Ah, okay. And then your, any, every piece uh, that you put in absorbs heat off the pan. Mm -hmm. So if you put too much in there, it's going to pull too much heat off your pan and you're not going to get that nice caramelization, that sizzling that we're looking for when you start steaming things instead of pan frying them. Exactly. Yeah. Have you ever had too big of a pan where like, it takes too much heat or no? I, I, yeah, I mean, you'll want to probably use something that's comparable to the product that you're using. Um, yeah, I mean, you definitely could. That question was about pan size, uh, in case you guys didn't hear it at home. Um, just could there ever be a pan that's too big? Which I would think part of the negative to that would just be it would take longer to heat up and you'd need more oil. But other than that. Yeah. 
Um, this being done in an air fryer. Oh, air fryer. In an air fryer? Yeah. yeah. I'm sure it could work. I'm not uh, as versed on air fryers, to be honest with you. Um, I'm sure it could work. So we're going to start flipping these guys. You kind of see that caramelization coming up on the edge of your piece of loin. That's when you know you're about ready. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> you have a question. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Susan asks, what form is star and knife? Star anise? Star anise. Star anise, star anise. Whole toasted. Nice. Yeah, nice little creamy slaw here with just a little bit of salt in there. We already have a little bit of salt on the cabbage. And you just mix the vinaigrette with your veggies. Exactly. You just said, yeah. Um, I have done a version of this vinaigrette before where I cheated because I didn't have bacon fat and I just used olive oil. It's delicious anyway, for the record. Thank you. If I didn't have bacon fat. If you didn't have what? Bacon, bacon fat. fat, yeah. Ah. It works. Uh, you know, it really could honestly go with a white wine or a, like more full body white wine. Uh, a dry Riesling would actually work super well. Yes. And um, a lighter Pinot would be good. Oh, yeah. I was thinking like an Alsatian Pinot Gris. A something Alsatian like that. Pinot Gris would be lovely. Super good, yeah. yeah. So there's our loin. Can y'all see this? Do I need to tilt it? Uh, we were a minute and a half. A minute and a half, I would say. All right, so then we're going to go into plating here. So we've got pickled rhubarb that was also part yes, of this. Yes, thank you so much for reminding me. Yes. Mandy, do you mind grabbing the pickled rhubarb, please? And last, we'll put in pickled rhubarb into our slaw. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> <laughs> is it over there? I don't, is that it? All right. It's right here. Thanks, Amanda. Oh, all good, thank you. <laughs> it's all right, my bad. Just asking you. <laughs> So the thing I love about this is because I, I feel like I'm just overwhelmed with rhubarb right now, and this is a great way to like make it that keeps for a long time. Yes. Right. Yeah, it'll pick, this pickled rhubarb will last for just as long as you probably want in your yeah. fridge. That rhubarb also adds a nice little bit of acid, nice little seasonal note there. Crunchy too. Nice little crunch to it. Yeah. right in the center. Now, if you wanted to pair this with a potato salad, any other kind of starch, uh, just right next to cream grits, spetzel. And some of that dressing, if you want more of sauce on there, uh, you could definitely paint that on or do a little swoosh, a little dollop on top. Uh, that would totally work for a sauce. I do have a pork reduction that I brought with me uh, that takes quite a long time to make. But if you come to Heritage Tavern, which I highly <laughs> recommend, you will try the full dish, which is with spetzel, braised red cabbage, and this pork reduction sauce. This takes us about three days to make. Uh, it's pork and beef bones, red wine, tomato paste, down to a nice gloss. Sauce technique, look at that. Love it. All right, I'm gonna finish that with just a small amount of fresh parsley. Or any kind of fresh herb. And a little bit of our bacon. Oh. Of course. Nice. What's good with pork? More pork. More pork. Yes. One more time. 
more time? Um, the toasted pods? Yeah, from the, that star on eyes, when do you remove the toasted pods from the rhubarb or do you eat them? You don't eat the star anise. I would not recommend that. Um, right. That's right. <laughs> so that part can go right in the slaw or garnish on top. And bacon. <laughs> and that is our panko crusted pork tenderloin with a cabbage fennel, pickled rhubarb slaw with a mustard bacon dressing. That's gorgeous. All right, let's give these a shot. All right. See how we did? Pass those down. Yeah. I'll plate up a few more for you. Here, I'll grab this guy. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Any questions? I mean, I, I feel like this comes together so beautifully and it has all of these wonderful like contrasting components, but there are a lot of things that you could substitute for, you know? That's kind of the point of this recipe. Yes, yeah. Uh, and that's why I like, I really, I, I like putting recipes together as guides and mm. then I like you to take it from there. Yeah. It's really just a blank slate for you to be creative with. I can't stress enough, you know, practice, 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 try different flavor combinations. Um, and this dish can really go all season long um, into the fall, into the winter. A root vegetable slaw would work out perfectly with this. Oh yeah. So Heritage was doing sort of meal kits adjacent like it was mostly done but i just had to warm some things up and i did one of them for new year's this year i wonder like would you want to keep doing that after restaurants are fully open again like did you did you like that would you want to do that more no i <laughs> it was really fun and challenging offering something new for our customers sure you know that's outside of our that we never really thought we'd end up yeah doing. Uh, so for all you know the challenge that was really fun um I would probably not continue doing it just for the sake it's very cumbersome for our staff and our team. Um, and we just want to focus on what we do well mm -hmm. and what the restaurant was built for. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll do, in our catering company, I'm sure with the pandemic kind of how it changed things, we'll continue doing stuff like that. Yeah. But uh, upon request. Okay, got it, yeah. <laughs> not us coming on every time. It was cool, but it looked like a lot of work. Like y'all did a lot for us, like yeah. me, home cook kind of thing, yeah. It was a lot of work. It looked like a lot of work. There's no question. <laughs> uh, Diane did ask if this is on the menu at Heritage. A version of this is on the menu at Heritage. We um, are serving it with braised red cabbage. Uh, sour cream spetzel, the pork reduction, and some pickled aronia berries. So if you have a sweet tooth, jam would go super well with this. That's like a currant jam, blueberry jam, something like that. Um, in Austria, there's a specific type of mountain berry that I cannot remember what it is. But the aronia berry here in Wisconsin is the closest thing that I found to it. That's high in tannins. Um, yeah, please start eating. Um, higher in tannins, uh, great earthiness to it. And it just pairs really nice with the, the fried pork. Yeah. Yeah. Quince and Apple makes some beautiful preserves that would go, I think, really well with this. Yeah. Quince and um, Apple does such a great job. Yeah. The they're, they're not too sweet. But they have like a lot of that wonderful fruit, you know? Yeah, exactly. So. so I'll cook up a couple more of these for everyone else who's standing around. <laughs> and if as you have more questions, please. Yeah. But thank you, everyone. Yay. Thank you. Yay. Awesome. Thank you. And Lindsay, <laughs> I will hop right on to quick thank our sponsors once more. Um, Kronbacher, our official beer sponsor. Sick of Salmon Shares, our presenting sponsor, and of course, Hefnix, our official kitchen sponsor for hosting us. And um, that sounded very Wisconsin, hosting us. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, and Dan and Lindsay, that was amazing. It smells so good in here. Is it yeah. good, you guys? First bite? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Awesome. Thank you so awesome. much for watching, and uh, Thanks, we'll see everyone. you next month. Um, with Suhe Weiser. She's going to be making a beautiful fish dish, a Venezuelan fish dish. I'm so excited about it. Um, so, yeah, come on back next month. And go to Heritage. Yeah. <laughs> go to yes. Heritage. We're finally at June 2nd. Everything's opening back up. <laughs>
Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you. Yay! Thank you. Yay! <laughs> I think I'm getting less awkward.